I am Megan O'Neill. I'm one of the Forest Health Specialists that will be presenting today. And with me is Eric Otto and Rachel Dewey. Um, and then I did realize that, so Rachel just got married and changed her name, and I did not change it on the slide. <laughs> so Rachel Nichol is also Rachel Dewey. Um, so I am based in Bemidji. Um, so I have the northern part of the Northwest region that you see there. And then Rachel is in Brainerd. And so she kind of has the southern part of the Northwest region. And Rachel also works very closely with our tree nursery. So she spends at least one day a week there helping them with their forest health or tree seedling health issues. Eric is based in Grand Rapids, so he has everything in green. He's the Northeast region. Brian Schwingle, who most of you have probably heard from at some point, isn't here today, but he is our Central Region team member. And then, of course, Val Serenka is our excellent program coordinator, and she keeps us all working together and moving forward. So I'm going to start my presentation today by talking about what we do. Um, just to kind of get you guys oriented, we work in the state of Minnesota on all forested lands. So our priority is state land. Um, and Minnesota has about 17 million acres of forest and 4.2 million acres are under DNR stewardship, um, and that includes 59 state forests. So of the Minnesota forest ownership, 24% of that is state land, and that is where we really focus our time. But we're really lucky that we get called to come work on other lands as well. So regularly we get called to come work on private lands, um, and so that private tribal industry, which makes up 44% of Forested Acres. We do a lot of work on that. And we work um, with our great federal partners as well on the national forest. And then where there are county forests and um, county forest forestry work, we work closely with them as well. Our primary goal, our primary part of our job is to figure out why trees are declining in the forest. Um, so we work with land managers and other professionals to answer that question. So a typical day, we might get a phone call from a uh, land manager asking about a tree issue. We will walk through some of our basic questions to see if we can narrow it down over the phone. And if not, that usually results in a site visit. So we'll go out to the site with the landowner or the forester to talk about what they know about that location. So on the bottom left, you can see a northern white cedar there um, and the dead needles on that tree. So as a result of a site visit that was discovered to be arborvitae leaf miner in northeastern Minnesota, so tiny, tiny little insect living inside those needles and very hard to detect. Um, something that, you know, we you wouldn't be able to diagnose over the phone. <laughs> and then the picture on the right was one from Brian. He went out there with a forester um, to investigate those really interesting looking scars on those trees. And while they're out there, the forester figured out that they had done some pile burning in that area uh, previously and uh, those scars were actually from those piles so we investigate everything from insects tree diseases and then abiotic issues as well once we've helped uh, landowners land managers figure out what the issue is our next step is to try to minimize tree death and control those issues. Um, so there's not a lot that can be done for some things, but other issues, we do have management techniques that we can use. So those top two pictures are both examples of oak wilt management, different options. And that's a big part of that is talking with the land administrator, the landowner, to see what options fit best for what their forest is like and what their goals are. And then that lower picture 
is an example of a heterobasidian root disease control. So you can see those stumps, the uh, freshly cut stumps were painted with a fungicide to eradicate heterobasidian from one pocket in the state, and we continue to monitor for that disease. We also do a lot of trainings, um, webinars like this, before we were all working from home, we would go into schools and work with teachers or go to state parks, work with student groups. We uh, go to the state fair and we answer people's questions. And we work with other forest health specialists from other states. We work with foresters throughout the state to do trainings to really try to make sure if we're seeing something, we want other people to know about it too so that they, um, can control those forest health issues. And then we monitor and evaluate landscape level tree health issues. And in a normal year, that is done in an airplane. So you can see the map there shows where there is um, spruce budworm defoliation in Minnesota. So that data is collected uh, during our annual aerial survey. And we use that to keep track of outbreaks that have occurred and that are continuing to occur. Um, as you can see in that bottom graph, that's a graph of defoliated acres. And that information can be used to help managers predict what to expect in the next coming year, in the coming years as far as insect and disease issues. Help it, and that helps us inform our management decisions. We have quite a few products that I want to make sure you guys all know about. Um, so the first one is a really fun forest insect and disease newsletter. It's a great opportunity for us to write about what we are seeing. And this comes out about three or four times a year, depending on um, how many topics we have. And we try and keep this really current so that, um, you know, if we're seeing something in the spring, we want to write a newsletter about it so that everyone else who's reading our newsletter, will, if they see the same thing, they'll know what that is. If you're interested in signing up for our newsletter, I said, like I said, it comes out about three or four times a year. You can just go to our homepage. Um, you can get there just by Googling Minnesota DNR Forest Health. And at the bottom of the page, there'll be that sign up for updates option. And you just put your email address in there and you will start getting our newsletters. One of our other products is our annual forest health report. And so that comes out once a year and that is all of the data that we collected throughout that season. Um, those are also available on our webpage, and we have annual reports that go back to 1969. So if you want to know what was going on with spruce bedworm 10 years ago, that would be the place to look for that. Um, they're full of really good information um, and all of the highlights from that year. And then our other product is our um, aerial survey data. And that's available for the public on the Minnesota Geospatial Digital or Digital Commons. Uh, and I want to talk quickly about that aerial survey program, how, what we do, and how you can use that information. So we get some funding from the U.S. Forest Service to monitor these landscape issues. And we use a nationally standardized procedure. So you can see in the image there, those are our transects or our flight lines from 2019. All of the stuff in the brown is what the DNR surveyed and everything in the green is what the Forest Service surveyed. So you can see between the two of us, we try to cover the entire part of the forested part of Minnesota, so we get a really good view of what's going on from the sky. This survey occurs from June to August, so that can tell you a little bit about what issues we can actually see during the survey. 
Um, we didn't do one this year because we could not have two people in a plane and we need a pilot and a surveyor. So we'll hope to pick that back up again in 2021. And we are able to cover 100% of the forested um, acres of the state every two years. And how we do that is by find alternating flight lines. So you can see the blue lines, those were our 2019 flight lines, and the brown lines are the 2018 flight lines. So every other year, we'll switch our path to try and get really good coverage so we can say we got eyes on 100% of that forested area um, every two years. We record um, defoliation dieback and mortality that we deem significant from the air. So um, if you're flying over a stand, you might see some crown dieback. So you would record that as your damage. And then we like to record the cause of the damage. And our surveyors are pretty good at doing this. So um, in this example, the cause was um, an abiotic damage and we it was deemed as in decline. So that was your cause of damage. We also record the host species. So in this case, it was either big tooth or quaking aspen. And then the percent of the trees that were affected in that polygon or in that stand. So we look at that stand out the airplane window and say, okay, between 11 and 29% of trees down there are affected. And so that would be kind of that moderate category. A couple of the limitations to the survey is that most of our polygons are not ground truth. Um, I think just over 1% of them are, and that's just uh, because, you know, we live in such a big state, it's hard to get all of those polygons on the ground. So if you are going to use that data, keep that in mind that there is some, some error in it. Um, and it's really good at summarizing those large scale issues um, so you know things that you can see from an airplane if it's one or two trees it's gonna be very difficult for us to catch <laughs> we survey acres not trees and then our surveyors are also really good at identifying the damage types so that's uh, really encouraging and it makes the data really useful but it is not super precise spatially so those polygon edges are definitely not um, set in stone, they're drawn while we're up in the air, so keep that in mind. Um, and we aren't great at picking out like those out of the ordinary things or early detection of, specific, of certain things, but kind of as the years go on, we are really able to pick that up. And so I'm going to quickly walk through where you can get this data and how you can use it, what there is available. So you would go to um, gisdata.mn.gov and that brings you to this Minnesota Geospatial Commons. In that search the commons bar, if you just put in forest health, you will get to our page. Um, so you'll be able to access our last six years worth of forest health data. Um, this is what it looks like when you bring it up. And then if you were to click on that survey 2019, you would be given the options of how you want to access that data. So that first option, that static preview, is just a image of all of the polygons over a state map. So it's, there's no data behind it, it's just that image but the, the rest of those files you can use to actually access the data that um, we've collected. So say you were going to download those shape files and use them in ArcMap, you might have something like this. I just zoomed in on Beltrami County because that's where I live and I highlighted a bunch of the polygons around that area because I wanted to know what was happening in those polygons. I brought up my attribute table and you can see that in Beltrami County, a lot of our tamarack are affected by Eastern Larch Beetle. 
So all of this data is out there and publicly available. So we're really trying to encourage anyone who wants to use it to please go ahead and use it. So next I'm going to quickly cover a few of the more interesting things that we found in the forest health world in 2020 during our field work. The first one is white pine cone beetle. And this was something that Eric really started to notice. Um, and he was noticing a lot of white pine cones on the ground. So this is a native beetle and it occurs in the same native range as white pine. Um, it was, this issue was pretty widespread in Northeast Minnesota this year. And we think that part of that is because white pines had a really heavy seed crop uh, or a cone crop. So we think that that probably promoted um, these beetles. What happens is the adult beetle gets in there and it, uh, it girdles the, where the cone connects to the tree, kills it, and it causes it to fall off. And so that's what people really notice is those cones on the ground. And the um, eggs are laid in the cone. They emerge and overwinter as adults in the cone on the forest floor. And that picture, you can see that little exit hole on that cone on the ground. The next big thing was something that we noticed and no one else did, it seemed like. We didn't get very many calls about this, which was really surprising because it was such a widespread issue. So it's red pine shoot moth. Um, there was a really big outbreak of it and you can see the picture on the left, that's what the typical damage looks like. So you can imagine not a lot of people maybe notice that for that this year's growth um, is turning red and dying, but there's a caterpillar living in there. This outbreak was huge. Um, it, was north of Bemidji all the way down to south of the Twin Cities. So really widespread, really interesting from our perspective, but surprisingly very few public inquiries about why this was happening. I think it's just a difficult thing to see. And within the stands, it seemed like that most red pines had some sort of attack. It, we estimated that between 25 and 80% of new pine shoots were killed this year, um, but it is not a really concerning thing in the long run because it's not killing those trees. It's um, applying a little bit of stress and they might have a little bit of a deformed growth pattern, especially if it continues, but overall it's not doing major damage to the trees. And there seems to be a lot of native predators on these. So you can see in the picture there that poor little guy was parasitized. So um, we're hoping that nature will just kind of bring this back into balance. And then lastly, I'm going to talk about something that Brian saw in Southern Minnesota, and it was this fatal bark splitting on younger Northern white cedars. So you can see in the picture there, kind of below that branch connection, the tree is split. Um, and a small percent of cedars seem to die in a kind of a scattered pattern, scattered pattern across southern Minnesota this year. We're still not totally sure why that happened. Um, it could, it's likely to be environmental caused. Um, we had some pretty cold temperatures and some pretty warm temperatures, which may have caused these trees to um, kind of grow in a strange way and Lit. Also, they could have been, the seed source could have been slightly out of where its native area is, um, so causing some growing issues. And with that, I am going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to pass it on to Eric and he's going to talk about the next section of things that we saw this year. Okay, 
Hopefully that looks all right. I'm gonna take that silence as a yes. So as Megan mentioned, I'm gonna cover the standard stuff. So nothing too out of the ordinary, as I call it. So these are forest health issues um, that occur almost every year in Minnesota. Um, it can be insects, diseases, abiotic issues. Um, sometimes they can be more prevalent in one year than another, but uh, for the most part, uh, nothing that isn't normal in Minnesota. So as Megan mentioned, I'm Eric Otto, I work in the Northeast region. Um, there's my email there if you wanna send me a question, um, you can just uh, send it to my email there. All right, so starting with spruce budworm, a very usual suspect in Northern Minnesota, especially Northeast Minnesota. Uh, what you start to see on the left uh, with early damage are these scorched uh, crowns, usually in the top of the tree. Uh, that's due to the budworm feeding. So if you can see on the left there, we have a late instar budworm that is um, partially feeding on the needles and then that gets caught in its silk webbing. And um, that's what you see from a distance is over time those needles turn red to brown um, and then it gives off that scorched appearance. So in Minnesota, uh, there's been pretty much a consistent population since 1954. Um, and that's pretty much when surveying started in Minnesota, I believe. And I believe the first reported damage of budworm was around 1912, um, but it was probably prevalent much longer before that. And so in Minnesota, it typically feeds in one area for about six to eight years uh, and then moves on to another part of the state. Um, that's generally how long balsam fir white spruce can tolerate uh, feeding damage from budworm before they succumb to mortality. So from the air, uh, what it looks like is once those trees start to die, so balsam fir, that's usually about three to four years of consistent heavy feeding. White spruce, it's about five to seven, is um, the landscape pretty much turns gray. So this is an aerial view taken by Mark Roberts, um, who is a US Forest Service aerial survey for national forest in the upper Midwest. And um, you can see this obviously from the air are just driving in Northern Minnesota. And this also poses somewhat of a fire risk with these standing dead conifers. Um, so they're with our aerial survey data that can be used for community wildfire protection plans. Uh, there's also cost share assistance programs for private landowners um, available as well to clean up um, any dead or dying balsam fir and spruce. Okay, so now we'll go back in time a little and show how budworm has moved across uh, Northeast Minnesota about over the past 20 years. Uh, so Mike Albers, um, previous Northeast Forest Health Specialist, now retired, I believe called this the Spruce Budworm movie. Uh, so unfortunately, we'll only be able to see a small part of it. But as you can see it from 1998 to 2005, uh, it was in mostly Northern St. Louis County and then it moved, oops, to central Northern St. Louis County from 2006 to 2013. And 2014 up to last year, 2019, it's mostly in Lake County, uh, the main impact zone. And then 2020, uh, as was mentioned, we couldn't conduct aerial surveys. However, we do have um, a rough estimate of the impact of budworm this year. And so this was performed with ground surveys. Uh, Mark Roberts, as I mentioned, performed a lot of ground surveys uh, in this area, um, as well as incorporating satellite data. Uh, there was a DNR fire flight that also helped map the small extent of the uh, impact zone, uh, just to give a rough estimate of where the budworm population is moving and the size and extent of it. So basically it's the seventh year of defoliation in this general area. So a lot of those balsam fir and white spruce trees are dying. And as you can see in that short movie, it's slowly moving eastward 
also closer to Lake Superior. And this was further confirmed uh, doing spruce budworm egg mass surveys. And this can help estimate the level of defoliation for the following year by determining how many egg masses are on um, at least the outer branches, the 15 inch outer branches. And that's just confirming that it is moving eastward. Also in Northern Minnesota, particularly Northeast Minnesota, it was the eighth driest growing season ever recorded. Uh, you can see in St. Louis uh, Lake and Cook County, um, it was very dry. However, in uh, Southern Minnesota, you can see it was also very wet. So it's very variable in the state, but uh, in Northeast Minnesota, North Central Minnesota, uh, there was a lot of transplant shock. Uh, we received calls from landowners we also did some site visits with foresters. Um, uh, this image on the left shows uh, jack pine seedling. This was with a site visit in northern Kuchichin County, uh, just showing the needles browning. And we did send some samples to the University of Minnesota Plant Disease Clinic just to confirm there was no causal organism, which there wasn't. Um, so that was just transplant shock. And for the most part, once some precipitation returns, they do bounce back. Um, but some salines can uh, succumb to mortality from this transplant shock. Also with this drought uh, in Northeast Minnesota, it's expected that there will be some aspen and birch decline. Um, that image on the left can be a common scene driving north on Highway 61, uh, an over mature um, aspen and birch stands. You can have dead and dying trees. Uh, that image on the left is an aerial view of the extents of aspen and birch decline. Uh, this has been mapped previously with our aerial, aerial surveys and that would be something important to monitor in the future to see if there is a small uptick in the amount of decline. All right, so large beetle uh, we expect maintained its extreme populations in north central northwest Minnesota. Um, so this is a native bark beetle. Um, you can see the image on the left, just the impact it has on large swaths of tamarack forest, uh, just decimating it on a landscape level. Uh, the image on the right just shows um, where it feeds. It makes its galleries in the phloem where it uh, also mates and that ultimately results um, over time in mortality of tamarack trees. So we estimate that there's about 50% of the Minnesota tamarack cover type. So that's where tamarack is the most dominant species is being currently impacted. And you can see at least since 2001, uh, when the outbreak first started, when it was picked up via um, aerial surveys, uh, it's gradually increased each year uh, with the accumulated acreage. And as I mentioned, we don't know where the population is this year. Um, we expect it's still maintaining um, similar levels as last year in its impact on Tamarack, but we're not for sure. And then just looking at the impact since the outbreak first started in 2001 to 2019, uh, you can just see um, the wide range across Minnesota uh, and Northern Minnesota. In 2019 is the red polygon. So you can see um, it didn't really subside last year and we don't really expect it did this year as well. And so with research from uh, the University of Minnesota uh, Brian Akuma's lab in the Department of Entomology. It's been shown that uh, warming climate is helping promote this outbreak. Um, it enhances or it makes the beetles develop more quickly. Um, the overwintering population has a higher survivor rate and they can also have a second generation in warm growing seasons as well. And there's also another insect, the large case bear that could be promoting this outbreak by uh, predisposing uh, tamarack trees with the foliation. So the large case bear um, is actually 
an invasive caterpillar from Europe and it defoliates tamarack. Uh, they usually put out a, another set of needles and it doesn't have um, a huge impact, but it could be stressing tamarack trees. And it creates these characteristic um, unique um, cases you can see on the left out of uh, tamarack needles. And on the right is what it looks like from the air. You can see it looks somewhat similar to uh, eastern larch beetle damage, um, just subtle differences um, when viewing it from the air. So again, with no aerial surveys, we don't know where the population is. Uh, you can see the amount of acres uh, impacted has been somewhat high over the past 20 years, fluctuating a little bit. Uh, but again, with research from the University of Minnesota, it's been shown that over the past two decades, uh, their activity overall has increased. And that's probably due to more of the population reaching the overwintering stage uh, due to longer growing seasons. And there also seems to be less effectiveness of um, native biocontrol agents against large case burr as well. That's helping this population um, defoliate more tamarack. All right, so moving on to leaf miners in northern Minnesota. These are also very abundant, but fortunately they're not decimating uh, trees and resulting in mortality. So two common ones are aspen blotch miner and leaf miner on balsam poplar. So these are both from a caterpillar, both in the same genus. And then there's also another leaf miner, uh, the birch leaf miner. This is actually caused by a sawfly, but as you can see, it causes a similar type of damage, uh, this mining damage within the leaf and you can kind of see through the leaf, um, which was also very abundant in northern, northeast, north central Minnesota. So we observed this pretty commonly this year, as well as uh, last year. Uh, we expect the population is increasing, um, which is not how the ordinary can have higher intensity years than others. And as I mentioned, uh, very minimal damage to tree health um, can look concerning. We typically receive a fair amount of calls on this, but um, overall, mostly an aesthetic issue. All right, so now moving down to Southern Minnesota, uh, there is the latest spring frost, at least since 2016 uh, recorded. So most of this was in Southeast Minnesota where the lower slopes uh, were defoliated due to uh, freezes that occurred from May 9th to the 13th. And so I believe there was one reported temperature of at least 13 degrees Fahrenheit, so I got quite low. And you can see the bottom of those slopes, all those trees um, that were defoliated and are brown with all that cold air sinking. And this was quite extensive. I believe it was from northern, north of the Twin Cities down to the Iowa border. And that's just a close up of northern Pin Oak showing frost damage. Um, can reduce growth a little, but for the most part, uh, not really a health issue and they'll resume growth once it warms up. Um, also, we're starting to notice trees dying uh, from flooding events uh, from 2019. So overall, the southern 60% of Minnesota, so that's about from Brainerd southward, uh, experienced its fourth wettest growing season on record in 2019. And so this is one instance where Brian Schwingle investigated this, where he was doing oak wilt work and he noticed this oak tree um, that died within one growing season. Um, and that was actually from flooding damage in combination with three line chestnut board damage, as you can see um, in the left image. Um, it can be somewhat difficult to figure out the impact of flooding damage as there can be a lag time of hardwood trees dying from flooding um, due to the extent of flooding as well as uh, the tree species as well. Uh, so it can be somewhat difficult to figure out uh, the full um, impact from these flooding events. Also with flooding, there were reports from uh, landowners of this sudden ash dieback. Uh, this was in Changwatana State Forest 
uh, where they thought it was emerald ash borer, but it was actually from flooding. And so uh, emerald ash borer usually doesn't result in this sudden ash dieback where in the previous year it looks healthy and then it's suddenly declining. Usually with emerald ash borer, it's more of a gradual decline and you'll have other symptoms such as epicormic sprouts. So with the emerald ash borer, uh, it was conformed in four new counties. Uh, you can see the counties that were recently infest infested in 2020 are in the hash marks. Uh, you can see west of the metro area, area um, Carver and Sibley County are two new counties that were uh, quarantined. And overall, there wasn't really a major jump in the range of EAB in 2020. You can see new infestations are the red triangles. A lot of those new infestations in counties are just a few trees that are infested. And it's good just to bring up um, that polar vortex that occurred in early 2019. Um, it was thought that it should push back the population of EAB about one to two years. And so hopefully moving forward in the new near future, there won't be any major uh, jumps again in the range of EAB. And just a few other noteworthy tree health problems we noticed out in the woods. Uh, this one was in northern St. Louis County near Hibbing. Uh, there's a willow leaf beetle outbreak on lowland and upland willow. Um, you can see the willow leaf beetle there. It, skeletonizes the leaves and from a distance um, the willows will just be totally brown in, in appearance and can be concerning. Um, for the most part it has a minimal impact um, on the health of the willows unless it's occurring uh, for multiple consecutive years. Um, the exact species of this wasn't determined but if it's occurring next year it'd be good uh, to collect some of these beetles and try to ID it to uh, determine the exact species. Uh, European pine or red pine sawflies were found pretty commonly on jack pine. Um, earlier in the year, there's some jack pine budworm surveys conducted, and these were found more commonly than jack pine budworm actually. And what they'll do is mostly eat the older needles, uh, the newer needles too sometimes. And for older mature trees, it doesn't have that big of an impact. Um, but it seems like their population is somewhat increasing. Shoot flight on red oaks. Uh, there's a few things that can cause this. Um, there's some longhorn beetles that can uh, damage shoots of red oaks, as well as a few fungal shoot blights. Uh, Botryosphere was pretty commonly observed north of the Twin Cities. Uh, this can be concerning, um, but ultimately doesn't really impact uh, the health of the tree. And then fall webworm was also um, pretty commonly reported. We received lots of calls on this too. Um, and it seems their population is increasing. So it makes those characteristic tense um, webs at the ends of branches. It ties the branches together. And sometimes it can pretty much engulf a whole tree with this webbing. It can look very concerning, but again, very minimal impact on the health of the tree. Uh, in southeast Minnesota, it's fairly commonly to see it on walnuts, um, but it can be common on other hardwoods as well, such as um, lindens and ash. Um, so it'd be good to monitor the population of this in the near future. Okay, so that is the wrap up on the standard stuff. And hopefully, Rachel, uh, has joined us. Yes, hello, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Excellent, I'm glad to hear that. So I'll go ahead and um, I'll share my screen. So yes, and let me, um, let me go ahead um, and see if I can um, share my video as well. 
I've been, <laughs> there I am. I've been having a number of technical difficulties this morning, which Eli Sagor has um, heroically walked me through. So thank you very much, Eli. So just to quickly introduce myself before I get to the positive news, um, as Eric said, my name is uh, Rachel Duby. Um, it recently changed from Rachel Nichols, so you might be familiar with that name, but I cover the Northwest region with Megan, but I'm based out of Brainerd. My position is a little bit different because um, I work 25%, oh no, and let's see, now my slides aren't advancing, let's see. There we are, okay, <laughs> so uh, the technical difficulties continue. I work a quarter of my time at the Minnesota um, State Forest Nursery helping them with seedling health issues. Prior to that, I worked with the Minnesota Forest Resources Council, um, but I've been with the DNR since 2013. And while working for the state, um, I got my master's degree in forest entomology, studying the invasive species gypsy moth, which was a lot of fun. But now, yes, moving on to um, our forest health good news section. Um, and of course, with, with forest health, as always, there will be some caveats. We can never get um, <laughs> too positive in this uh, realm, of course. Um, but the first piece of good news is that forest tent caterpillar populations really appear to have remained low across the state following a population crash in 2019. Damage in uh, most affected areas appeared to be light and only a small number of caterpillars were observed. In addition, uh, small um, scale egg mass surveys only found a number, a small number that is of egg masses um, in the northeast region of our state. And the only areas where significant defoliation was detected were in Mille Lacs and Kennebec counties in relatively small areas. Uh, another pest that has laid low in 2020 was the jack pine budworm, the main insect enemy of jack pines. And the population of this species crashed in 2018 and we're still at rock bottom in 2019 when only one area um, of defoliation was detected by our aerial surveys. And that was the same case again this year, um, just a, an area of about 300 acres was affected in Beltrami County in Northwestern Minnesota. However, without aerial surveys, of course, additional um, damage may have to may have um, occurred that we did not record. Um, however, we did uh, conduct population surveys this year and we detected a slight increase of jack pine budworm. So their populations may be at the beginning of a recovery. Um, as Eric mentioned with, um, we were able to find those interesting uh, soft flies during those surveys. Uh, more good news in our forest was that bur oak blight was seemingly not a big problem in our forest this year. Bur oak blight is a native pathogen which only affects the leaves of bur oaks. And here in this picture, you can see that characteristic V-shaped of necrosis on the leaves. And you'll usually start to see these symptoms in late summer or early autumn. Some bur oaks seem to be more susceptible than others to bur oak blight. You can see a picture of um, an, a susceptible bur oak in the right side of that picture, very close to a less susceptible bur oak. And some of these susceptible bur oaks can be hit by this disease year after year. And it seems like um, bur oak commonly affects already stressed um, trees taking advantage of their stress situation. But the good news is um, because bur oak blight um, affects uh, bur oak so late in the season, like other late season defoliators, it seems to have a fairly small impact on the tree's health. Um, like I mentioned, here is um, an example of one tree in particular that my counterpart, Brian Schwingle, has been following for years. One of those trees that really gets hit year by year um, with bur oak blight. This particular tree is in Zimmerman and every year it seems to lose um, 75 to 80 percent of the leaves or they turn brown due to bur oak blight. However, every single June it looks just like um, this healthy tree on the left in June when it reflushes with no visible dieback or epicormic shoots. So really even though bur oak blight can look really awful on any individual tree, it really doesn't seem to be a big deal for healthy bur oak trees. And from our observations, levels of bur oak blight on the landscape scale really do seem to be tied to May precipitation levels. Again, it is a fungus, so it likes wet conditions. And the warmer colors on uh, this precipitation map 
shows where we deviated below average levels of precipitation uh, covering much of northern Minnesota and western Minnesota. And then these cooler colors, um, green to blue, you can see where we had above average precipitation levels. And that really occurred almost entirely in southeastern Minnesota. And Brian Schwingle has done um, a lot of burr oak blight um, surveying, and you can see his results here showing the percent incidence of severe burr oak blight. And you can see in uh, north central and more western locations, um, hardly had any incidents, if any at all, of se severe burr oak blight that Brian could find. But an interesting point here, if you look at this 14% um, fine, the highest incidence of burr oak blight, you'll see that it corresponds pretty nicely with this, um, with the areas of the state where we received the most precipitation this year. And one more bit of good news on the oak front, a severe tubacchia leaf and twig blight that affected widely scattered white oaks only in several locations in uh, southeastern Minnesota last year was much less severe this year. And you can see this on this individual tree here. The symptoms we started to see last year were blackened leaf petioles and necrosis of uh, new shoot growth. And we suspect that this particular fungus was so abundant last year was because of all the heavy spring and summer rains this year, really enabling this um, disease to take hold. Um, even though it was at low levels this year, we'll continue to monitor the situation next year. And then continuing on with our very oak centric good news, uh, and this is a very important one. Uh, this year, there are no significant jumps in the range of the devastating invasive dis um, disease, oak wilt. And oak wilt um, is a deadly fungus that can infect all species of oak. And um, however, our red oak trees, those in the red oak group, northern red oak and oak are most susceptible to it and die on average within two months of in, um, infection. And here's a photo showing that rapid timeline from infection to death of an individual tree. And unfortunately, once a red oak tree begins to wilt from this disease, there's no saving it. Burr oaks will die on average um, one to seven years after infection and white oaks can die any time from um, one year to 20 years after infection. And while oak wilt can kill an individual tree very quickly, it actually moves quite slowly if left to its own devices and if we pesky humans don't move it across the state on a wood or firewood. Um, but in addition to its inefficient movement, about half of the modeled range of red oak in our state is still oak free and that's really great news. Uh, this map is a little bit updated. It shows a high risk zone uh, from 2019. But um, we, as you can see, we still have half of our resource to really to protect. And because of the biology of oak wilt, we really do stand a chance to slow the spread of this invasive disease. Um, and this really highlights the importance of oak wilt control. The green check, check marks on this map show where um, oak wilt control efforts took place in 2019 and 2020 in Morrison County, which is one of two uh, fronts where we're really doing battle with oak wilt in our state. Um, all but one of these um, oak wilt controls took place on uh, private land, and most of the control costs were covered by this great LCCMR grant uh, to the county, but some of them were funded in part by the DNR Division of Forestry Cost Share Program. And control of oak wilt is really important in Morrison County, not only to protect that county's resources, but to protect Crow Wing County just to the north. And you can see here on um, this northernmost uh, green check mark was a recent find this summer of oak wilt just on the border between um, our counties. So I'm glad we were able to do some control on that point. Um, to further protect the red and pin oak rich area um, of Crow Wing and Cass counties, our forest health team collaborated with the University of Minnesota Extension to, to develop this website intended to help landowners um, in these counties to report suspect oak wilt on these trees because it can be quite difficult to identify once it's um, becoming newly established in an area. Uh, we promoted this website through U of M Extension, our newsletters, and some press releases and social media. 
And while this effort didn't result in any um, oak wilt fines in Crow Wing or Cass counties, it was a really good opportunity to get the word out to the citizens um, of these counties. And we hope to do more outre um, outreach um, related to oak wilt um, now and in future years. And now switching uh, over to our eastern front in Pine County, um, again showing recent oak wilt control um, that took place there. Um, on this part of the state, many of uh, these control efforts were um, funded by the private landowners, but some were covered by uh, DNR cost share, as well as a US Forest Service um, grant to the DNR. And the great news is, is that we have these funds from the Forest Service, $80,000 to control Oakwell on its uh, northern front in uh, public lands. And uh, another piece of great news is that the LCCMR has recommended additional funding to Morrison County to, um, to control Oakwell. Um, and this amount is about four times as much as they were originally granted for Oakwell control several years ago. And our last bit of good news, still focusing on our oaks um, in 2020, is that really despite the appearance of um, widespread decline, our oak populations actually appear to be doing just fine. Um, oak decline is a phrase that we use to describe progressive dieback and eventual death caused by a number of factors. And um, we got a lot of reports of this this year, especially in private lands. And um, it really demonstrates that um, this was probably occurring because the conditions um, in yards and in cities are really a much harsher growing environment for trees and opportunistic um, um, organisms such as two-line chestnut borer and armillaria do take advantage um, in those situations. But the FIA data do show um, at this point that there is not a population level decline. So that is great news. However, um, the data do show that more um, oaks have died recently compared to um, past um, survey periods in FIA, but this isn't too surprising given um, a number of extreme weather events in recent years that have stressed out trees. Um, as an illustration, here's a map of two-line chestnut borer damage in 2014 and 2000, to 2017 in central Minnesota on oaks. And um, these attacks started to happen two years after extreme droughts occurred in 2011 and 2012. Um, I did see this year um, several instances of rapid um, red oak death in central Minnesota. And some of it may have um, been due to continued recovery from, um, from that past drought in 2011 and 2012, in addition to um, the uh, fourth wettest um, growing season last year and result resulting flooding, our very dry spring uh, this year as well. So there have been some stressful conditions for oaks, but overall they do appear to be doing just fine. And with that, I am so glad that my presentation worked. Um, thank you very much, everyone, uh, for your time today, and we'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Great, thank you, all of you. So yeah, we've got a couple minutes. If folks have questions, you can go ahead and type them in the chat. If you remember to do so, uh, you can send them to all panelists and attendees so folks can see them too. I am having a little bit of trouble <laughs> not sharing my screen anymore. I didn't have the uh, opportunity to do a test run <laughs> prior to the presentation. <laughs> well, we're enjoying this uh, <laughs> this lovely puppy on your screen here. Um, so we do have uh, a question. DJ's asking um, about scattered balsam fir, full grown trees going rapidly green to completely red, dead early to mid summer. Have seen it for a couple of years, no obvious effects to foliage. Um, I can address that just from what I've seen in my area. Um, I've also noticed that a little bit on balsam fir, and I've done some investigation, and the only thing that I have found consistently is our malaria um, and it seems to be pretty advanced by the time that I get there and 
um, see it under the bark. So um, that's what I've noticed. I don't know if any of the other forest health specialists have seen something similar. Yeah, I have not detected any of that in my area. Yeah, I have seen some, I don't know if it's related um, to maybe, um, I don't know, depending on when you see it, if it's midsummer, if it's weather related, because I know in northern Wisconsin, they've also been seeing uh, balsam firs that pretty much turn from green to red in one growing season. Um, but yeah, I'm thinking it could be an abiotic cause, but also, you know, once they get stressed and they could be more susceptible to things like our malaria. Great, um, and we do have just a couple more minutes and there's a couple more questions here. Um, I think this came up, but it only went to the panelists at one point uh, for Megan, um, how to differentiate between red pine shoot moth and fungal shoot blights. Yeah, um, so one of the big differences is the shoot moth, you will see it pretty much consistently throughout the tree. Um, and shoot blights like Diplodia, you usually see more in the lower part of the crown. So that's one thing to look for. Also, if you can get your hands on those shoots, um, you can usually see where there's that, there's almost a gallery going through. So if you can cut that shoot open, um, you can see that. And those shoots, when they are affected by shoot moth, it is, it's just that growth from this year and um, later in the summer, it just falls off really easily is one of the things that I've noticed. So Robert here asked, is some of the oak mortality due in part to over maturity? Potentially, however, this is kind of a new phenomenon. Um, we we're seeing an increase in this year. I think if it were close related, related to over maturity of our forest, it would probably be a pattern that we're seeing over time. We haven't delved deep into the data to, to look and see um, trends across years, but at least comparing um, the last surveying period to this surveying period, we have seen a recent increase. And the forest health team really is tying at least what we're seeing right now um, closely to these extreme weather events and remember too, um, we're not seeing a lot of this oak decline out in the forest. We really are, at least this year, have been seeing um, and hearing reports from um, private landowners, mostly in yard trees. Um, where I've seen most of the oak decline in um, my area, is actually um, most concentrated in an area where we had a strong windstorm in 2012 and um, two line chestnut borer in, um, infestations have been reoccurring over the years since that, um, since that event. Great, thank you. So I have just one more here now. Um, it's 101 now. So like I said, if there's folks that have to sign off, you'll see this, um, you'll see this uh, in the recording. Um, so Eric asks, can you further describe the relationship of or differences between leaf miners and sawflies? Yeah, so I just sort of simply categorize them as the same. So those three different leaf miners, there's the aspen blotch miner, uh, one occurring on balsam poplar, and then there's the leaf miner on birch. Um, so the, there's two uh, the one that occurs on aspen and balsam poplar is caused by uh, caterpillar and lepidoptera. And so sawflies on birch are in hymenoptera, so a different type of insect. Um, I think that addresses it. I don't know if you guys have anything to add to that. Yeah, and really, I, the type of damage you'll see is very different too. Um, with you know leaf miners, you're you're not likely to see that actual defoliation, but with sawflies, you'll all you'll often see defoliation or very chewed needles as well, which Eric's picture is highlighted nicely. <laughs> yeah, I guess I was referring to the birch leaf miner sawfly. Yeah, uh, yes, yeah, <laughs> yes. Sawfly, but yeah. <laughs> Great, so that's all the questions I see for now. Um, if anyone else has something. 